Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, and welcome to the Fading Memories podcast. This is an awesome, I say that every week, talk today with Mary Crescenzo. I think I got that right. Uh, we are mostly talking about self-care through creative writing. We're going to touch a little bit on the arts and dementia engagement. She is the author of the new book, The Planet Alzheimer's Guide. So thanks for joining me, Mary. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, Jennifer. So the book came out this past spring, right? Uh, actually, it's 2021, and we have a new edition about to come out, but um, ah. not too many changes. But yes, I wrote it during COVID. So that was one positive thing about that moment where I couldn't leave my house. So what was the inspiration for the book, besides having a lot of time on your hands? Well, I had worked at the time for 30 years in this field of arts engagement. It wasn't a, really a field at the time. I was one of the pioneers in creating methods and ways to communicate and connect with people with dementia, Alzheimer's, and cognitive decline. And so I wanted to share this with others. I had stopped doing the work myself as an arts practitioner, but I knew that if I could communicate with caregivers as to how they could do this, and anyone can do this, uh, art and to get interaction with one people that you love, um, that if I could do that in a book, then I could share that, I could speak about it. And so I thought, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. And this was the time. So I just said, all right, I'm going to do it. And that way I could take that next step to really have a, a, a huge audience to share with others. That makes sense. So before we were recording, I was telling you the story that my mom was very creative. She was a beautiful seamstress back when my sister and I were young in the 70s. Um, we always had those matching mommy and me Christmas outfits, dresses, um, which I look back on and kind of cringe because <laughs> those patterns were definitely 70s. She also did, um, she did painting. I can't remember if it was acrylic or oil. She may have done both. And later on in life, um, even in, into the early stages of Alzheimer's, she did woodworking. So she was always trying new hobbies. But after my dad died and she moved to memory care, that was one of the first things I tried as an engagement while I was visiting because I couldn't handle the same question every five minutes or two minutes. And so I, that was where I leaned to is doing some very simple art projects she was always afraid of doing it wrong, which made mm. me want to just bash my head into the nearest wall or tree. I mean, we tried leaf rubbing, just like really easy stuff. Like you can't really do it wrong. Mm -hmm. But she just kind of, I don't So I've always wondered, was I like putting pressure on her that I wasn't aware of or? You know, it could you know. be a little bit of that expectations. Uh, also, she knew that in some in some way, she knew that maybe her skills were not what they were, whether she could express that or not. And sometimes you think that painting would be more intimidating, but it really isn't, or even make singing, because in painting, I have what I call fluid uh, engagement, where you don't say, draw a tree, or let's do this. Just start with the paints and be positive. And so sometimes that even though it seems like painting, oh gosh, uh, is more freeing to the mind. So, um, you know, you did what you want, what you thought would be best. And sometimes I do things or have done things with clients and it doesn't work. So what do I do? I redirect, I try another thing. But it's interesting that you said that she was worried that she would do it wrong because I think you also mentioned that as an artist herself, she wanted to do things that were different. But in this case, something that she knew inside maybe she couldn't accomplish this so that might have been it that but you've been you know you're engaging either way it's not working okay no big deal so yeah I'm it was sorry. just very frustrating because of course i i i tried all of the suggestions for positive engagement and having positive visits and man did she and i fail all of those just how the show came to be because it got to the point where i'm like 
I, this is back in the old days when one actually drove to a gym and took classes and drove home. And I was thinking, oh, I should find a podcast that talks about caregiving. And back in 2017, there was one. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. And it wasn't my wow. cup of tea, which is fine also. You know, I don't, I like tea. I don't like coffee. It doesn't make coffee bad. I love the smell of it. So it just, I thought I can't be the only family caregiver that has had this experience and is looking for advice. And so I figured, well, I might as well go find the people to talk to and do it in a podcast. So her fear of doing it wrong is what led me to doing this. So um, There's talk always, of, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You said that, excuse me, it made, <clears throat> sorry, made me think that there is always some light to be found in the darkness of this disease. And this is the light you have come out from necessity of that. So yeah, so here you are. Yeah, and I love talking to caregivers turn creative, which I think out of sheer desperation and necessity, there are a lot of us. So, but you were talking about fluid painting, which reminds me of a, a YouTuber that I like to watch. There, um, There's two of them. They're um, watercolor artists and they teach like very basic. Um, they've One of them's done kind of like a series of really simple kind of cartoonish animals, like really cute. I'm like, as soon as I have some extra free time, I'm going to try that because I've tried watercoloring before. But one of the things one of them talks about is just slapping color on, pick whatever colors you want, just slap the colors down, doesn't matter. You know, we're going to make something out of what looks like a mess. So it seems like something that you are also advocating to do with people with a cognitive impairment. Do so you want to Absolutely. explain a little bit about how that works? Yes. Um, well, first of all, we all have the creative spirit in us, every one of us. And someone might be listening saying, oh, I can't draw, I can't paint. And what I always say to those people, and I say to you now as you listen, um, has anyone ever told you you can't? A teacher, a, a peer, a sibling. And I always get the answer, yes. So first of all, let's erase that from our brains and hearts. Everyone can be creative. We all have self-expression, which then leads to, yes, even persons with cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera. So um, I, I create that concept, that setting, because it feels open. It feels safe. There are no wrong answers. Uh, let's just put paint on the paper. And that makes someone feel calmer and also in the moment. They're mm -hmm. not thinking about, can I draw a tree? Can I do this? I'm not an artist. They're just doing that. And sometimes that turns into abstract, something quite beautiful sometimes. And it also starts sometimes to turn into representational art where you see faces or people. And then we start to talk about, oh, what do you see here? What, what would you like to call this, this painting? And the communication begins. I remember one woman telling me, that's my ugly brother. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, or someone else had a person like going up a hill, uh, like a little lamb going up a hill. Now these aren't, you know, I mean, we, we're all creative. Some of us are blessed with a high level of talent, whether it's basketball or ballet or art, but we all can be creative. So there was this little lamb going up the hill. And I said, well, tell me about that. I don't wanna say, what is that? Tell me about that. And she said, sometimes it's hard to get to where you need to be. And this woman was not all that verbal. So what when you use the arts, not just painting, but singing, storytelling, movement, dance, what you begin to do is touch on what's inside and the and truths come out that you never would expect. And that's the other thing. Don't have expectations. Just do it. And you as a caregiver will have fun too. That's what I tried to do with my mom was just something fun that wasn't, she always asked me, so what have you been up to lately? And I would answer. And I've now learned that I should have given her the same answer every time but I thought I was being better. I, I always went and visited on Mondays. So it'd be like, oh, well, it's Monday. And I went to the gym and did spin with Jennifer today. The spin instructor's name was also Jennifer. And then she'd like two minutes later. So what have you been up to lately? Well, it's Monday. I went to our rotary meeting and there was a guest and they talked about X. Two minutes later. Well, it's, you know, where have you, what have you been up to lately? 
it's Monday. I came to visit you. Now I realize I should have just given her the same answer all the time because by breaking up what I'd actually been up to into little chunks that she could process, I was not giving her the same answer. So that's probably why she kept repeating it so much, which is really frustrating <laughs> to learn at this late date. It's not going to help me at this point. Um, but it's, you know, it's something that I've learned from a past guest. So that's shows me that, you know, these conversations are definitely beneficial if I'm still learning things. But and I, as a caregiver, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's okay. Well, I, I just wanted to do something other than basically she would have been absolutely thrilled to just sit around and shoot the breeze, mm -hmm. which would have exactly. been great if we could have had a conversation. Well, okay. So let me comment on that if I might. First of all, as a caregiver, it's the most difficult job. Uh, it's the most worthy job, but there's no handbook for this. And that's also kind of why I wrote this book with, with my angle on it and direction. But okay, so maybe if you would have asked her what she do this week, you might get an answer that in your world makes sense, or you may get an answer that makes to you no sense at all, but that's okay. So now you redress that. Oh, you went to the beach? Oh, that was great. With with grandpa, we know grandpa's no longer here, perhaps. But just meet meet the person you love where they are. And it becomes so less frustrating. Of course, there's a sadness to that because mm -hmm. you know this person in a different way. But um, if you could just be in the moment with them, it'll. It's amazing how relate new a new relationship happens. Again, you're mourning the loss of the old. If you stay in the present, I know people that had horrible relationships with their relatives, and they tried this, and now they had a brand new relationship. They were best friends. That was isn't that crazy? Because now they're in a different world, which I call the planet Alzheimer's, and you have to enter that space. But it's not easy. You have mm -hmm. your emotions, you have your memories. So uh, that's why another thing about art is good, because again, it's in the moment. Now, Jennifer, you were um, a portrait photographer, right? Yep. Okay. And when you took those shots, you had to be in the moment. You weren't mm -hmm. thinking about the bills or anything else. And so that moment became the, your art. And so if we can be in the moment, whether we're singing songs, we're dancing, or we're you know, throwing scarves in the air, that's a joy that comes from inside. You know, I can always, sometimes there would be like this, I don't know how to describe it, but this feeling like, I <sighs> got it. And I did it for long enough. I never, I, even on shoots that were really tough where two-year-olds were literally ricocheting off the trees. Thankfully with photography, you literally need a fraction of a second. And so you just keep going and chances are you're going to get, you know, several images where the kid doesn't look like he's ricocheting off the trees. You might look, he might look super thrilled and happy, which is of course the expression you want. Um, I always try to untrain parents from, please stop teaching your children to say cheese because they would, I would get the little jack-o'-lantern squinty eyes, giant, giant cheese. Oh, it's painful to do and it's painful to look at. But yeah, no, it's, um, and I always channeled like, if I was feeling one way about my mom or like the family that got their family portraits taken probably less than 36 hours after my dad died, they did not know during the session that that was where I was at. And I just channeled all of my love for my dad and all of my complicated feelings for my dad into their session. And mom was really happy. And so when she picked up the final product, then I told her what, what was going on in the background. And she was just, she was like, oh my gosh, you should have canceled. We should have rescheduled. I'm like, no, it's fine. Like life was going on, you know, it wasn't going to do me any good to sit around and be sad. And I just channeled all of my emotions into their portrait. So it did everybody good, but my yeah. mom's answer to when I would ask, I would, I would tell her, well, this is what I've been up to. What have you been up to lately? Literally, I would get to, you know, same old. <laughs> like there's no entering that world. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's when you take out the paints or you, you take out of Frank Sinatra or the person that they love to listen to. Like, let's listen to this. It's always, let's see what happens. Uh, and just try it. But, you know, just sometimes going for a walk in the garden, 
there's just so many ways just you but you know just you being there here's the thing about this disease um it's still a mystery i went to this uh, international conference and there were in Krakow, Poland, there were a thousand people there from all over the world, and it was on Alzheimer's and dementia. We had doctors there in the highest level saying, we're not 100% sure of why this disease is what it is. So the fact that it's such a mystery, we just have to go with, with what we know and just connect in whichever way that we can. Um, I, I may, If I may, you were talking about how you were trying to cope with the situation with not finding a podcast. And so it led you to create this one. That's how this creative writing, uh, self-care for create for caregivers with creative writing uh, evolved. I had written, uh, before the book was even written, I had written a play called Planet A about the inner world of Alzheimer's. And it came from my work. So when I started this work, I would drive home crying every night because I saw the conditions people were living in. I saw the way they were treated. I saw just the disease itself. And I was young and I just, it upset me. So I thought, how do I process this so I can go back to work the next day? So I started writing these poems in the voices of the people that I saw from observing what they said, from my imagination, and just to give them voice. And then I started singing, this is working. I can deal with this. I can manage my feelings. And so then I thought, well, if this works for me, shouldn't it work for caregivers who are directly firsthand in this? And so that's how I started doing that. And I realized that they enjoyed it. They were had a safe place. They relaxed. They had a break. They found out things about themselves. They found energy under, a renewed energy in their own lives. And it just gave them that safe space to express themselves. So sometimes out of frustration with something, something good comes just like your show. Which is interesting as I've talked to people about journaling and self-care and I've never been a journaler and maybe it's because I'm surprisingly quite a very private person. And I, I've journaled in the past and gone back and read stuff. And it's like, I don't want other people to read these feelings or these thoughts. And so with my mom, there was no way I was journaling what I was thinking because I would not want my daughter, even though she probably knew or future strangers to like, come back and be like, holy crap, this woman was like not happy with this situation, but I have been, and it's, I need more time. Um, I need about 48 hours a day been working on a book of the humorous stories from my mom's time in memory care because and this kind of goes back to what how you were creating the poetry is there are some serious characters in memory oh, yes. care uh, my mom befriended a couple of them so and they were all named diane all three of them that, that's not confusing enough and they got into like a little bit of mischief never anything problematic but just like you knew they'd been up to something because, <clears throat> excuse me, they rolled up the rug from my mom's room and moved it to another gal's room and like kind of hit it. I mean, like, why? Like, could somebody please explain these things to me? And there was one resident who was literally the worst klepto on the planet. If she laid her eyeballs on it, it was hers. And one day she put eyeballs on my purse. Thank God I saw her coming because she, I'm only five foot two. She was shorter than me, obviously older, obviously had some form of dementia. And I thought, I cannot get into a wrestling match over my purse with this woman because it's going to be elder abuse. Like, unless I give her my purse and then I'm not going to be able to get home. Um, but we had a battle over my dog. We had a battle over my mom's dog. It was just, you know, there was humorous stories. And then I describe like why do people quote unquote steal they're not really stealing she just looked at my purse and thought oh that's pretty there's i like that purse it's mine <laughs> it's pretty or it is mine i actually think it's mine or it's also a way of control like i can have this because i i mean i'm not saying that these are the thoughts but there's a lot of loss in mm -hmm. them so this is something i can control something that's mine because and when I read back what I've written thus far, um, 
it just brings back all like the the happy positive memories which when you look at it from afar all you kind of remember was it was hard and had these visits and uh but when you like focus in on there was also a gal there who was irish and she literally paced um i think her family might have needed to help pay for the new carpet because she just walked constantly and she mumbled she didn't speak clear words and one day my mom and i were planting seeds in uh egg cartons um because i was i was making seedlings for my garden and i was trying to figure out like how many seeds versus how many spots in the egg carton and i verbalized a math question out loud and i'm not a math person i knew the answer because it was like basically basic multiplication but this gal walked by and just popped out the answer clear as a bell and i was like i bet you she was in accounting or some number something that i don't do <laughs> because mm -hmm. in the entire time i was you know my mom lived there for three years she would literally come up to you and mutter in your face so she was talking to you, but you had no clue what she was saying. And she would try to hand you things. And one of the caregivers said, you have to be careful because she doesn't always hand you the nicest stuff. If she's come out of the bathroom, don't take anything out of her oh, Yeah, I was like, oh, thanks for the warning. I'm like, ugh. You know? And this was pre-COVID, so you're like, ugh, it was not fun. But yeah, so it's just like most of the time I didn't interact with her because she was in her own world. But just that one popping out of that basic multiplication answer was just yeah. fascinating it's, it's amazing like as you say this all of a sudden this profound stuff um i want to <clears throat> excuse me i want to talk about the journaling but that reminds me of a very bittersweet story I'll, I'll share with you and i usually get emotional so hopefully i can hold this together um we were painting and i used to be an art teacher before i was an uh, arts practitioner and community artist and so we're painting there was a new woman she's painting and she's painting i had not really worked with her before working you know feverishly on newspaper anything to paint and i usually didn't ask about the person's past life first i wanted to meet them where they were and then when i find out something later like this person could have been a math person then i can put two and two together and She's painting and painting, and um, all of a sudden, someone someone says to me, um, "Oh, you know, she was an art teacher." I lost it. Oh yeah. I just started crying, and I would never do that at work. And I just the tears are running, and nobody knew what to say, and she knew. And this woman like had a face like this. She wasn't paying attention to anybody. She didn't speak. She reached in her pink robe pocket, gave me a tissue. Oh, cute. Wasn't that amazing? Just amazing moment. But there's those moments of lucidity that we can't discount because they could be in there. And can art bring those things out? Yes, it can often. So back to journaling. I want to clarify my creative writing with caregivers is not journaling, perhaps, because that's a heavy thing to, to begin. Um, and I also say you can share it with someone. You can not share it with anyone. You can throw it away. You can save it for your your daughter when you're not around and she might help to un be understanding more of what you were going through. But what I'll do is I'll start with like a word, like, um, you know, let's, let's write about hands. Whose hands? Your hands, someone you know. Uh, let's write about a kitchen, a kitchen you remember, a kitchen you'd love to have. And so this starts neutral, but those feelings about being a caregiver will find their way into that. And as they're writing, this begins to grow from that neutral space. So um, I try to do it that way. I'm not a journaler either, I'm just like, so that's why I thought, well, let's try this. And it's really, um, it's a great feeling when you get those, those feelings out on paper. And again, you, you don't have to share them with anyone, just yourself. It'll make you feel better. Well, you said hands, and my first thought was thinking about my mom. My mom liked to bake. Now, she didn't bake from scratch. Um, we were always like the Betty Crocker, you know, cake mixes and stuff. Um, I don't think it was as easy back then. As it, it's like I, I make cakes and stuff from scratch, and I find them better. But brownies aren't always better. <laughs> I like the mixes. And 
that and then you said kitchen so obviously i'm like tying those all back to my mom so i thought that was kind of an interesting that um my very very first it wasn't even a whole thought it was a flash of a picture was i did a portrait of technically five generations one of them was missing so it was like a two times great grandmother great grandma one of the i think it was great great grandma great grandma was deceased grandma mom baby and we had all their hands together it was just like it just told the story of time just this one image of all these you know you have the little baby hand and the the you know 100 year old woman hand was very different but you could see how just that one word which is neutral sparked all these memories for you and all this emotional response and that's what this writing is about because you got to put your feelings somewhere and mm -hmm. maybe you don't want to tell your sister who doesn't really understand that you're the caregiver and she's not so don't tell me what to do kind of thing or or someone who says oh you know doesn't understand it you're telling yourself by putting it on paper and then when you reflect on it you can say like okay it's all right you know and and i just did something and i wasn't thinking of what caregiving i was just writing so yeah it's interesting how that word opened that up for you i'm gonna have to try this on some of my friends so for my birthday i like to do you know i'm got i'm at the age where it's like you know like I'll, I'll buy the craft supplies i need maybe you could buy me a gift card if you really want but i'd rather do experiences and mm -hmm. i had seen on hgtv i don't even remember which show but the host had taken the family to a paint splatter studio. I'm like, that's cool. There's gotta be one of those in Sacramento. I mean, like, hello, it's the state capital. And lo and behold, there was this very new, um, owned by a woman of color. So I'm like, bang, you know, entrepreneur, woman, woman owned entrepreneurial business, woman of color, I'm there. So I said, this is what I wanna do for my birthday. Our two friends who are essentially scientists, especially the one who works with hazardous waste materials, <laughs> I didn't need to see her face to know that she was like, Ugh, I'll do this for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think once she relaxed into it at first, it's like everything is covered in paint and you, know, you put on the smock and everything to cover your clothes. And then you touch something and your hands are covered in paint. And she was that, that kind of gave her the ick. But once she got into it, like her and her husband and my husband, who's a real estate broker, they were all have it like their three paintings were amazing and it's just and my husband really got into it i was shocked i was trying some different stuff so i like theirs actually better than mine but it was like i was just thrilled because it's like just go with it I'm like I'm like just throw the paint on the on the canvas it doesn't <laughs> matter if it's going to hit the wall that's already happened in here and i think they had a good time it it took her a little time to kind of chillax into it um but i was surprised that you know because she was so reluctant, reluctant. <laughs> at the well, beginning let's you know, play and we we forget we forget how to play we forget how to uh be artists when we're young we're painting and doing things like that so it just opens things up and again you found yourself and she found herself reluctantly in the moment and then she let it go so you know, that is what happens. And um, you don't have to be an artist to do that. It just, just go there and open it up for yourself, whether even singing, people say, I can't sing. Okay, so you may not have a voice like a famous singer, but you can try, you can sing, you can enjoy it, uh, movement, all <laughs> of these things, all of these things. Um, and I just, I guess I, I've known this since I was a child because I happen to be a very creative person and I, I am an artist in certain ways. And I do have, I think that little bit of elevated, like a basketball player might have, because it's something I can't help but do all my life. But, you know, you receive criticism about that. And then when you're younger and then you just like hide it, but it's there. And I knew that these people as um, wanted to mention to you, although I started in the mid seventies, you know, with a career um, when I graduated high school, which was probably 10 years before that, um, I wanted to get a job before I went to college. And I saw this ad for an art teacher in what was called a nursing home at the time. 
And I wasn't a teacher yet. I became one. But I thought, I could do this. They didn't care, like, really, who came in and did this, to be honest with you. And I went in there, and I started working with a room of people that I think, and when I look back, had dementia. Some did, some didn't. And I just said, well, I know that I can have fun with art, so I guess they can too. It was kind of very uh, naive in a sense, (laughs) so natural to me. And we were talking, painting, crying, laughing, telling stories of World War II. Um, And I just saw the joy. And so that stuck with me. And I also have a thing for older people now, I'm one of them, but um, (laughs) because my grandfather was so important in my life and he died when I was nine. And so I remember the nine years of just amazing relationship with him. So I just have this reverence. So as a teenager, I'm like, I get these people. And later on, when I started doing this work, I said, I know this can work. So I want, and if you, if you're thinking of this, um, and the book itself, by the way, talks about different forms of art. You don't have to be an artist. The person you're working with doesn't have to be an artist. Just try it and see what happens. Doesn't work, bring a song the next time. Doesn't work, bring some scarves and move around, you know, carefully if the person is physically not as able. Uh, tell stories, start a story, read a poem that from that person's error. I don't know if you remember many years ago, we had to memorize poems. They don't do that in school anymore. Hmm. I think we did a little bit. A little bit, right? Me too. So if you bring a poem from that person's era or from the, you can start reading it. Sometimes I get people like saying the next line, even if they don't, even if they just sit there and listen, you are not just staring at each other. And that is what I hear often when I speak to people who are caregivers, they say, if I knew, I wish I knew this when I was with my husband, because I would go there and spend two hours and I didn't know what to do with them. We just would kind of stare at each other. These are things you can try. Whether they work or not, you can try them. And don't give up. One of the things, so my listeners, most of them should remember, I started handmade card making during the pandemic um, because there's something that you can give away and people like it. And then you make more and you give them away. (laughs) It's, it's a very satisfying hobby, but one of the things that's really interesting is they will tell you, you know, if you're using an inking technique or you're doing, you take the wet ink and spray it on the paper and you're like, Ooh, I don't like that. They're just like, just keep adding more stuff, which is really counterintuitive. It's like, I don't like this. (laughs) There's so many ways to cover up spots you don't like on your background, which generally are four and a quarter by five and a half. I think I got that right. Yeah. Um, it's like a quarter of a sheet of paper. Just keep going. Like you look at it, you think, eh, that's okay. Add more ink, add more splatters, add them. Like I never understood splatters, but man, I sure like splatters now. And it's just, it's, and it's something I do regularly because sometimes, you know, you got a, you got a Monday that just makes you want to tear out your hair and maybe I don't have time to make cards. Sometimes I'll just go through the backgrounds I've already made, or let me go through my tools. And like, my husband asked me to make a card for his friend's birthday. And it's like, okay, let me, let me like think that one through. Even if I spend like 20 minutes just thinking it through, I don't even have to physically do the activity, just kind of sorting through the papers and looking at, you know, he said he wanted it to be a fishing theme, which I don't have very much stuff for that. And it's like, okay, well, how do, how do I want to start? We want to like use the one stamp that's got a fishing pole on the background or, you know, and you kind of channel your mind into that direction. And the next thing you know, you're like, oh, okay. I don't feel like murdering people right now. (laughs) I don't feel as tense and frustrated. And it's really, really interesting. Sometimes even just cleaning up. I'm, I'm a pretty organized, neat person. So like work week, the desk does not look like my crafty desk (laughs) does not look like it does on the weekend. Sometimes just organizing and cleaning and getting all your supplies back exactly where you want them. And it's, it's just very Zen. Yeah. Very Zen. It's, it's a focus. And that's what all these different art forms are. They're just a focus, whether you accomplish something or don't, it's just a focus away from everything else that is a difficult task for caregivers and also everything else for the person who is dealing with the frustrations of dementia. So it's a focus, it's in the moment. And 
I think we often don't let that creativity shine. And so even cleaning up, even organizing, doesn't it feel good cleaning out your closet? Because you are taking things, ordering them, putting in different places, creating something new visually, right? Than what you mm-hmm. have. And so that's a creative act. So that's why we have this. We never get a chance to let it out. And every time we do, I, I know that some people that, oh, I can't do that. I can't. But when you let it out, it feels good. Have you ever danced without smiling? Who no. does that? You know, uh, sing without just feeling good, whether you're laughing at yourself or not. So, um, yeah, it happens. Again, art is not, it feels magical, but it's not. It's scientific. In our brain, there are centers that want to be unique and creative as each of us are. And that's where I found that, again, you can let joy into the darkness of this disease. And it's a horrible, difficult disease to deal with. But um, it just seems to often work. And just, again, see what happens. Try it again. Don't give up. I'm going to use that line on my scientist friends. Art is scientific. It's proven science. I'm going to watch their brains explode for a minute. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Well, if they know anything about Einstein, they know he played the violin. And so his science science is creative. It's just in a different a different way. That's true. But, yeah. So, yeah. I, see what- I, th- I think on, the, on her part, she overthinks things. Mm-hmm. Um, she's working on a report. She's retired, but she's contracting back. And she's working on a report. And... So she works for Sandia Labs, which is headquartered in New Mexico. And there's a one in the Bay Area. And the reports got a photograph from Albuquerque and one from Livermore. And she wanted them to be similar. I mean, obviously the terrain is different. And she was concerned it was a photo of like the landscape outside the lab at night. It was at sunset. She was afraid it was too dark. So, of course, she asked me, is this too dark? And I looked at the other image. I'm like, no. I'm like, are you going to print this? (laughs) Because this is where the technical aspect of being a photographer comes into play. If she was going to print it, yes, it was probably too dark because the paper would have sucked in all the black ink and it would have turned into mud. I didn't explain that to her because (laughs) she she probably would have understood that. But um, she says, no, it's all digital. I'm like, okay, no, it's totally fine. And I explained to her why because I knew she needed to know why. But... I think if she had just looked at it, like, do they look good together? Would I hang them on the wall together? But no, she was like, I don't know what she was ever thinking. <laughs> just scientific mind. She was thinking yeah. in a different way. Yeah. Which I find fascinating. So do you have any more? Because we, we ser- seriously have been talking all about creativity, which is awesome because I, it's my favorite topic. But do you have any other, like, prompts for starting, like, a self-care creative writing habit? Yes. Um, one good thing about my workshops that I do, whether I do them on Zoom or I do them with one person or I do them at a a big conference is I'm there and I give you the opportunity with these different words, but I'm not going to be with you all the time, right? So what are you going to do when you don't can't think of which words to use and you're not sure? Look out the window. Look at the first thing that you see. Write about it. Think of a a noun, person, place, or thing. The first thing that comes to your mind, put it on top of the paper, and then just write about it. So you can sustain this this therapy, so to speak, um, with yourself without having me and the prompts. So uh, I never want to choose a prompt that's too, um, what's the word, igniting. So once okay. I use the prompt keys, and after the conference, uh, it was actually on a Zoom, um, she said, that was really, what is the word? Um, like, a, not a red flag, when something really like is, is in your face. She goes, that one was a little too much. I, I, you know, for her, I guess maybe being in the nursing home for her relative or the in the care place, locking it or losing the keys, remembering her mom lose the keys. Again, that's subjective. Somebody else might find that to be a great uh, prompt. So I, th- uh, I didn't find that one triggering or- It was you triggering know. to her and she said, oh, but 
Okay, so I learn too from what people say. But I think if you just on your own, so I, I do try to get more neutral words, um, but just look out the window or think of a color and find something going on there or a noun and just start writing. And don't don't be your own editor. Don't like, oh, spelling is wrong. Oh, this isn't <laughs> right, grammar's wrong. That's gonna, that takes away the creativity. It, what it's called is free write. Put your pen on your paper for two minutes. Look at the word, just start writing. Don't take your pen off the page. Even if you have to say, I hate this this project. Why didn't Mary tell me to do this? <laughs> I don't want to do this. You're still writing. And then it, the rest of what you really want to say, but you're afraid to, will begin to flow on the paper. So those are my suggestions. Just neutral words, write them down, put them on the top. And you know what? If you want to do a doodle underneath, you want to do a little picture, do that too. Um, I can tell you, from my own experience when I was, you know, crying and upset and needed a way to, to manage my, my interaction with persons with dementia, I can tell you that it will give you respite. These are the four words that I use, respite, break, relaxation, rejuvenation, more energy, and revelation about who you are, what you're doing, why you're doing it, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the circumstance, and really will set you apart from those feelings that are inside of you that you sometimes don't have time to deal with because you're doing everyday routines with the person that you love. So try it. See what happens. Well, when I look out the window, I see trees. Okay. But also, if I look closer to the window, there's a mobile that my friend made out of bicycle parts. So the you know, where the chain connects to yes, yes. chain ring is what it's called. And it's pinks and blues. It's my favorite colors and the hummingbird feeder. And that's about it because there's a lot of trees. <laughs> so I'd say pick like hummingbird, like maybe one word. If you start saying, it, oh, the mobile and with the chain, that kind of gets a chain, hummingbird, leaf. Well, when I think of hummingbird, I think so we have a feeder um the way our house is is the it looks like a single story but it's on a slope so the, the additional bedrooms in my office are all downstairs so most of the square footage is upstairs and when you go out the back we have a big deck so it's up a floor so we have a bird feeder on that deck and a bird feeder underneath the deck outside my office window and these hummingbirds <laughs> I probably could write a lot about these hummingbirds because I've learned that they're very curious animals. I've had them literally buzz through my hair several times, which is a little disconcerting, especially because it's like, you are what, maybe a two ounce little critter and you're like attacking me. Uh, I'm the one filling the feeder, you little monster. And, you know, they're extremely territorial. So there's frequently, you know, I call them bird bombings. They just fly over and they fly at each other. And it's like, you kind of feel like you're underneath some World War II planes. At least I assume I wasn't around then. And it's just, it's entertaining. It's humorous. Um, it's kind of jogs your curiosity because, you know, you just kind of kind of wonder. And I've had to look up, um, like, their lifespan because there's one particular one. That little turkey literally would hang out in the oak tree and watch the feeder. And if somebody else came by, shoom. He'd swoop, in, swoop on, and his wings were really loud, so we call him Buzzwinger. Um, if he's still around, this would probably be his last summer because it'd be th our third summer here. So, and they, I come do a, they come back. They come back every year. Well, I'm assuming that whoever, if Buzzwinger doesn't make his own reappearance, Buzzwinger Junior probably will. <laughs> you know, and we just we in Southern California have the same. We've got a deck, and we've got them, and I love to watch them. They just they're not afraid to come by near you and that buzz over my head. I kind of like it. Uh, and they're resilient and they're tiny and they're fast. And sometimes they fight with each other, but other times they're nurturing. And when I'm, when I go out to that deck and I look at them, I just forget everything because nature is a form of art that's mm -hmm. given to us mother nature or from God, wherever we feel it's coming from. And it's amazing to watch. And again, what is it? Focus. Bre my breathing changes. 
you know, my office is a mess. I got to walk away from it. My breathing changes. I'm just focused on this one thing of wonder. And that's yeah. what when you make art and your breathing changes. And when you're writing, it's a physical thing. And sometimes we need that just by a hummingbird. So I love them, but they drive me crazy sometimes. Yeah, they're, did you know their tongues are longer than their beaks? Yes, yes. It's like really strange. Have you <laughs> so ever, have you ever had one like hit the wall and then they go down or they're fighting? I've had that on the deck and we've picked them up in our hands and just like blew some warm air on them and just kind of pet them and they just, they're still stunned. And then I go get the little dropper and I feed them the sugar water and it's like a miracle in my hand. And then all of a sudden they, they wake up for, and they fly away. And to me, that is the most incredible moment that I've ever experienced with them. So I love them. I respect them. And um, yeah, they're, they're a gift of nature. Yeah, they're, they're very interesting little beans. So real quick, since we're talking about hummingbirds, if yes. somebody is struggling to start writing mm -hmm. and because they're having a hard time getting out of their head, like, I'm not creative. I don't know what to, That's could you just start by write like, so hummingbirds, you've got buzz, you've got wings, you've got beak. Could you just start like writing words that you yes. associate with hummingbird? And that yes. would be a... Yes, absolutely. That's a great idea. Just write the words that that connect with that noun or that verb or that hummingbird or something. Write the words down uh, and then just begin from there. See what 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 jumps off the page. The other thing you can do is you can write about them, but you'll when you like write a paragraph and you think this is very like clinical this is i'm not getting any of my emotions out why is that because you're defending that you know afraid so go in there and circle the words that the five words that seem most interesting to you in that very uh, even thing you wrote and now try for each of those words to write something and just write whatever comes to mind don't worry about anything else. So yeah, words are great. Pick them from a paragraph that's not going anywhere. That's like kind of a guard and you're guarding yourself with it or look at that object and write the, the words. Use your five senses and don't forget sense of smell and don't be afraid to be creative. Like the sky smells like uh, cotton balls. I mean that, okay, that's crazy. But <laughs> if that comes to mind, keep writing because it's yours. You own it. You're unique. Let your, you can't help but create uniquely and you can do it. And so can the person with dementia. Just be open, fluid, fluid guidance. Don't say this is good. This is bad. Just start a conversation from it. That makes sense. I can, my mom loved hummingbirds. So I can imagine asking her, what do you think of hummingbirds? Do you like hummingbirds? Um, what's neat about how, you know, just ask like really simple questions that are usually fairly easy to answer. And even if they get, they say, well, hummingbirds are really big and they're really quiet. <laughs> I'm like, okay, write that down. And get a and, book, get a book of hummingbirds and open it up or an art book. And like, let's look at the, oh, what color is this? When she says it or not, start looking at a book together of beautiful pictures of things that she loves, uh, maybe to someone who loves cars. That's going to bring back memories, right? Mm -hmm. It does bring back those fading memories, even for an instant. Sometimes the arts can bring out stories from the past as conversations can, can too. I honor all of you, every caregiver who is listening and you, Jennifer, as well, because I came to this without knowing anyone who had this disease. And so in a way you might be thinking, oh, it's easier for you because it's not someone you grew up with. And so I so respect what all you have to you that you must do. It's a difficult task. Uh, but now every person that I've worked with, I feel they're my family and I can remember their names. And so the work that you do is so valuable. Give yourself a break caregiver and do some writing or some form of creativity. You deserve it. They do. And what's nice about a lot of what we've talked about 
Is it something you can do in a very short period of time and get the benefits even if you only have five or 10 minutes? Like I was saying earlier, sometimes just thinking through a project, looking through my my stuff, my tools, it's just like, I guess because you're in the moment, you're you're not thinking about the 500 things you got to do this week or, you know, the dishes that are sitting in the sink or you got to deal with your loved one. You're just spending five minutes just thinking about something fun. Right. And it's, it is amazing how much of a stress release that can be. Absolutely. So, yeah. Persons Definitely. that I've worked with taught me so many, people with dementia taught me so many things about life. And one of the most important things they taught me was live in the moment because that's all you have. And so um, that's exactly what you're saying. Be in that moment and it'll be freeing for you. Even only for a short period of time, then you have to get back to the reality of what you have to do. Let that work for you. Well, that's a great place to stop. I really appreciate this conversation. You guys are definitely going to want to grab Planet Alzheimer's Guide because it's got all kinds of creative ways to engage with your loved one. And if you're anything like Mary and I, being creative is so freeing and so relaxing that even your scientific friends will understand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.